Hi, I am Jerome from Fastlane. Welcome to the series on the Cisco Unify Wireless Networking Solution. Today I would like to do a deep dive on RRM, Radio Resource Management, show you how this thing exactly works. So, as you know, RRM is a process by which your controller can control dynamically several aspects of the wireless environment based on the environment itself. And it actually does two different things. The first one is to manage the access point power level and channel. That's the first aspect. And the second one is to detect holes in your coverage and dynamically adjust the power of the access points as well. These two things look a little bit the same, but they are not exactly the same. RRM, Auto RF, the management of the power level on the way down and the channels is performed at the group level, whereas the coverage hole detection and correction is performed locally at the controller level. So RRM uses the traffic load, the interferences, so traffic load is how many clients are sending how many packets to the access points, interference is what other 802.11 access points are around. Noise is all that is non-802.11 activity around the access point, and coverage is of course client leaving the coverage cell, I'll show you that in a few uh, slides, and of course the other access points around it. Okay, let's look at how RRM works. So here's the situation. You have two controllers, WLC1 and WLC2. WLC1 has two access points, AP1 and AP2, and WLC2 has one access point, AP3. Each access point is going to send every 60 seconds a message, which is called RRM neighbor message. This is sent over the air on all service channels. These messages, you'll see that next slide, contain a certain number of information about the access point and the controller to which the access point is connected. And the game is that all the other access points um, will receive this message and will forward this message to their controller. Which means that somehow the message is going to start from WLC1, go to AP1, leave the network on AP1 on its radio and maybe be captured by AP2, AP3 or some other access points and be sent back to their relevant controller. Which means that if AP2 is hearing the message, AP2 is going to send it back to WLC1. Why do we do that? Well, because the access points sending the message back to the controller will also forward information about the radio environment, such as how strong the signal was heard, what kind of a um, interferences were heard, what kind of noise level uh, was detected, and so on and so forth. And this will also allow your controller to detect which access points are hearing each other and which are not hearing each other. So in the example here you see that we have room 1 and room 2. As we suppose that rooms are well isolated, um, access points in room 2 will not hear access points in room 1, which means that when the traffic will be sent out of AP1 radio, no access point is going to hear this message and no access point is going to feed back WLC1 with the information that someone heard AP1. This will allow your WLC1 controller to understand that AP1 is alone in its wireless environment. There is no surrounding access point around this access point. When AP2 is going to send its message, AP3 is going to be in range and will receive the message from AP3, uh, from AP2, sorry. So AP3 is going to forward this information to WLC2. And if WLC1 and WLC2 are in the same RF group, that is to say, if they communicate with each other about RRM messages, they will be able to determine that AP2 and AP3 are in the same wireless environment. And they will be able to work together to determine which access point should keep its channel, which one should leave its channel if they are overlapping, which power level should be set, and so on and so forth. And the way it works is that when the RRM message comes back to the controller, the controller will create what is called an AP group. And the AP group is basically all the access points sharing the same wireless space. So in my case, room 2 will have two access points in the same AP group, AP2 and AP3, whereas AP1 will be alone in its own AP group because nobody is hearing it, so it will be in its own group. Okay, so your controller can create a certain number of groups depending on which access points are hearing each other. The key here is that WLC1 and WLC2 should work together, right? Because if they don't work together, basically each of them will create its own AP group, but they will not be able to exchange this information. Therefore, 
they will not be able to coordinate their action to decide if AP2 or AP3 should leave a channel or if they should stay working together. But if WLC1 and WLC2 work together in a server ARF group, they will elect a leader and this leader will be the destination of all the RRM messages collected by any controller. In my example, let's suppose that WLC2 is the leader. So WLC1 and WLC2 need first to work together to determine this leader. I will show you next slide how this works. But once they've determined that WLC2 is the leader, well, all RRM message collected by any controller in the R group will be sent to WLC2. In this example, um, signals coming from AP3 getting through AP2 to WLC1 will be collected at WLC1 level and sent back to WLC2. So WLC2 will know that both AP3 and AP4 and AP2 sorry, are in the same uh, room and in the same RF environment. And WLC2 will be the one, as the leader, to determine which access point should stay in its channel and which access point should move if required. Here are a few information you need to remember. First, these RRM neighbor messages are sent every 60 seconds on all serviced channels. So if your access point is allowed to use 1 to 11 channels, it's going to send a message on all these 11 channels in a burst and then come back to its main channel. It is sent, this message is sent at the lowest mandatory speed at the max power. Let's say you know the power level number one, which is the maximum power allowed in your country. Well, that's the power that the access point is going to use to send its message. This ensures that all the access points, as far as the signal can possibly go, will receive this message and of course forward it to their controller. These RRM messages contain several information. The information, in, the interesting part is the group ID. Group ID, you know, that's a dynamic information. It's going to be created depending on which access point around is sharing the same wireless space. If you allow OTAP over the approvisioning, this RRM message will also contain the management IP address of the controller, but OTAP is disabled by default. There are two options which are not used, which are, you know, possible fields in this RRM message, but which are not used up to now. I'm working on version 5.2 here channel count and power level. These two are not used. Um, the channel count is basically the list of allowed channels for the access points. But basically controllers will be exchanging information with each other. So this information can be exchanged between controllers without the access point needing to send this information over the air. The same is true for the power level. The power level is interesting to know how strong you receive the signal on the receiving access point. But then the emitting controller can tell you through the cable, through the wire, what power was uh, used for the access point to send this message. So you don't really need to put that in the radio message itself. A key to sign um, the uh, message and of course the channel on which the, the signal was sent. Again, it's a burst, so you send it from 1 to 11. So even if your access point is supposed to be on channel 6 by default, uh, you might as well receive the signal on channel 8 if you're listening to this channel at the time uh, the burst is being sent. OK, let me show you that on the controller. So here I'm going to uh, a controller. And you see here, I have a default domain name here. That's the mobility group name. So that's a key information. You need to have your different controllers in the same mobility group name. The RF group name is a subset of the mobility group name. Why is that? Well, because how will your controller know about each other? Just based on the RF group name? Well, that's not enough. That doesn't tell you which other controller are in the same group and what IP addresses they have. So the way it works is that you create a mobility domain name, which is the mobility group name. And if you go here to mobility groups, you will configure which controllers are part of the same mobility group. So here my mobility group is pod 12. So all the controllers here in pod 12 will be queried when this controller starts to know what their RF group name is. And if their RF group name is the same as this controller, pod 12, uh, they will exchange information. So your RF group name needs to be a subset or your uh, mobility group name. So again, be careful. We have now mobility groups and mobility lists. So here I can know controllers which are in a different mobility list. So these guys will not receive RF information from me. They will exchange mobility information, but not RF information. So they need to have the same mobility group to exchange um, RRM messages.